sixth program of an eight-part series. I'm Kathy Magruder, and I'm the executive director for MCEC. We're really honored to host these programs. We'd like to recognize our series sponsors who help make that possible with their support and partnership as we produce these sessions covering a range of key topics for the current advanced energy landscape. First is Constellation as our voltage sponsor. Nuclear Powers Maryland has sponsored the series as well. And our great partner Siemens based in Beltsville. And we are grateful to Cone Resnick for supporting the 2021 Connecting to the Energy Economy Speaker Series as our power sponsor overall. Before we get started, we wanted to take a minute to share some data with you. In Maryland, investment and incentives in advancing the clean energy economy generally are covered from two sources of revenue. The Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, auction proceeds, and the Empower Ratepayer Surcharge. We thought it would be important for our audience to see the amount of those revenue sources collected over the past three fiscal years that have been tracked. The annual average for the Empower Ratepayer Surcharge is approximately $260 million and the annual average for the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative proceeds is approximately 51 million over each year. Um, our speakers today will certainly have some insight into how those program dollars are spent and can be used to incentivize and invest in um, renewable energy and clean energy project development. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to welcome our special guest speakers for today's program. The full bios of all of our speakers can be viewed online, again, at www.mdcleanenergy.org slash speaker series. This program will cover the, the uh, federal and state investment and incentives. We note that the change of administration in the White House brought about a renewed focus on implementing measures to reduce the impacts of climate change and encourage the adoption of non-fossil fuel energy sources. Some states have set aggressive climate change and energy goals backed with strategic funding and regulation. We asked our panelists, does Maryland measure up to other states? This session will provide information about federal and state policies, programs, incentives, and investments geared to address this important challenge. Our moderator today is Chris Rice, Chief of Staff at the Maryland Energy Administration. Prior to his current role, Chris served as Director of Programs at MEA, leading a team implementing more than 20 statewide programs and initiatives involving energy conservation and production. I've known Chris for a long time. He brings over a decade of experience in the energy sector, impacting all areas of Maryland's economy. He was appointed to the Electric Vehicle Infrastructure Council and was a Clean Cities Coordinator for over eight years. He sat on the Northeast Regional Biomass Steering Committee, the ARC Energy Committee, Renewable Fuels Task Force, the LNG Task Force, and the Chesapeake Bay Commission study on cellulosic ethanol. Mr. Rice is a Georgia dog. Um, he earned his degree in biology, uh, loves to root for the dogs. Um, he was awarded a certificate of completion for senior executives in state and local government program at the John F. Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University. And he shares with me that his favorite Halloween candy is chocolate and peanut butter. Chris, welcome to your role as moderator today, and thank you. Thank you, Kathy, and, and uh, thank you to the Clean, Maryland Clean Energy Center for hosting the speaker series on connecting uh, to the energy economy. This panel discussion will focus on federal and state incentives and is absolutely um, uh, timely as we endeavor to meet our clean energy and climate goals. Maryland is a national leader in climate ener and energy. <laughs> For example, Maryland is an original participant in the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, or REGI, as, as one of Kathy's slides uh, uh, mentioned, which has been capping and reducing power plant emissions across the region for um, approximately 11 years. 
Maryland has very strong climate goals require, requiring deep emission reductions, including a 50% reduction in emissions by 2030, which is substantially stronger than the, than the original US commitment in the Paris Agreement. And by the way, Maryland is a member of the US Climate Alliance. The Empower Maryland program sets a 2% annual energy consumption reduction target that utilities are responsible for achieving. The Renewable Portfolio Standard, or RPS, requires the delivery of 50% 50, 50 renewable energy by 2030. In addition, the RPS has a 14.5% carve out for solar PV and requires a minimum of 1200 megawatts of offshore wind. Something that we're going through right now in the state of Maryland is, is hearings for um, additional OREGs in, in uh, the waters off the coast of Maryland. In addition, the state is party to a multi-state MOU setting targets for electric vehicle adoption, both on the light duty side as well as the heavy duty and medium duty. So as you can see, there is no lack of policy to encourage the development of the clean energy economy. However, in order to see the fruit of the state's climate and energy vision, projects must be developed and steel must go in the ground. So this diverse panel will provide light on federal and state incentives to do just that. So we really do have a phenomenal uh, lineup of, of folks today. And um, uh, we are going to uh, first hear from Cindy Bopp of the um, loan programs office at USDOE, and then Eric Kaufman of the Maryland Energy Administration. We have David Brown of Constellation Energy and Lee Peterson of Cohen Resnick. So first up, we have Cindy Bob, and Cindy currently works as Chief of Staff to the Loan Programs Office at the U.S. Department of Energy. Prior to joining DOE, Cindy was a senior advisor at Holland Knight focusing on clean energy and manufacturing. Earlier in her career, she worked in climate change policy as well as carbon removal technologies. So I turn it over to Cindy for a discussion on federal loan programs. Thank you so much, Chris. Can you hear me? I just want to make sure. Sure can. <laughs> okay, great. Uh, well, first, I would like to thank the Maryland Clean Energy Center for inviting me to join you all um, this morning. It's a real privilege and honor. I'm Sydney Bopp, Chief of Staff at the Loan Programs Office at the U.S. Department of Energy. Um, looking forward to spending this time with you to talk about the opportunities that we have at the Loan Programs Office for project developers and companies who are looking to build new clean energy projects and energy infrastructure and manufacturing in the United States. If you can go to the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so the Loan Programs Office, the best way to really think about um, this program is like a commercial bank that sits inside the U.S. Department of Energy. So we are different from many of the other offices that folks might be familiar with at DOE. Um, we do not fund um, grant projects. We do not fund research and development or even pilot projects. We're here um, to provide senior debt um, in the form of either direct loans or loan guarantees for commercial projects that are being built in the first time in the United States. So we are able to um, provide that access to debt capital for projects that may otherwise have difficulty attracting commercial debt, either due to the innovative nature of the technologies that they're looking to deploy, maybe the size and scale of the projects that they're looking to build, and also just um, the market and um, uh, private lenders' familiarity um, with the technologies that um, uh, developers are looking to build. We're also very flexible um, in the loan programs office. So um, as I mentioned, we can provide loans or loan guarantees. 
Um, and we do have um, a fair amount of flexibility in terms of financial structures um, and ways that we can work to support project developers and their timelines um, for building these projects. And um, we are a, a committed partner. So we will work with companies um, uh, through the pre-development that they may be doing, um, early engineering, uh, uh, site selection, um, and uh, program design. Uh, we are not able to provide debt for those activities, but we um, can engage in many conversations and either on the technical side or the regulatory side, to think through um, what are the different aspects that may um, uh, of a project that may need to be addressed um, uh, in order to be able to access the um, loans and loan guarantees that we have available in our office. We are very active portfolio managers once our projects have closed on financing. Um, so we are able to provide long-term debt depending upon the useful life of the assets that we're financing, um, but uh, uh, throughout the, the term of our loans, we have a very strong and um, experienced asset management team, our portfolio management division, as well as our engineers who are working with project developers through the construction phase into operation and maintenance. Um, and for many of these technologies, there, there are many hiccups along the way. And so we are there um, right alongside you as you are developing, building, and operating your projects. Um, if, if anything comes up. Uh, we have currently um, over $40 billion in available um, capital uh, for clean energy and manufacturing projects um, that we're looking to build. It's not divided up equally, and um, I have another slide that'll go through the breakdown of that $40 billion, but it is um, $40 billion in um, uh, clean energy financing that's available at the Department of Energy. We can go to the next slide, please. So how does that 40 billion break down? Uh, first, we have our Title 17 Innovative Energy Loan Guarantee Program. This is a program that I think most folks are familiar with when they think about um, DOE's Loan Guarantee Program. Uh, we have um, about a $25 billion portfolio um, for our Title 17 projects that historically have been in the utility scale, solar, photovoltaic, um, land-based wind, um, and nuclear space. Uh, the way that we have um, uh, our authorities broken down right now, and this is in statute, so there's not a ton of flexibility, but we have approximately four and a half billion dollars available to support renewable energy and efficient energy projects. Um, a little under 11 billion for advanced nuclear energy, and this includes um, uh, nuclear supply chain um, that was just expanded in the Energy Act of 2020 that passed in December. And then eight and a half billion for advanced fossil energy projects. And this could um, also include things like direct air capture, industrial decarbonization, other carbon dioxide removal technologies, um, potentially green cement or green steel. Um, but uh, all of these um, programs are currently open. We have rolling applications um, for each of these three areas. Um, we are in the process of um, revising um, our solicitations to reflect changes um, to the Title 17 program um, that were implemented in the en Energy Act of 2020 um, uh, and notably um, a change to the fee structure. So in the past, we had application fees um, to just engage with us and submit your application materials. Um, all of those fees have now been deferred to closing. So unless a project um, actually closes on a financing um, with Title 17, they will not be paying those application fees. Um, we're also able to cover third-party um, uh, advisor costs um, that's an additional change from the Energy Act of 2020. So all of these process improvements um, that we've been working on under um, the leadership of uh, Jigger Shah, who is now the director of the Loan Programs Office, we're so fortunate to have him, but we're, we're going through the process of updating um, uh, all of our materials, but already in practice, 
um, very much implementing these changes to Title 17. Uh, the second program that we have is our Advanced Technology Vehicles Manufacturing Loan Program, or ATVM. Um, this is the program that most notably um, helped uh, uh, finance Tesla for the Fremont facility for the Model S. Uh, we have about $17.7 billion in remaining loan authority to support the manufacture of light-duty passenger vehicles that are achieving um, at least a 25% fuel economy savings over a 2005 baseline. Uh, but this uh, program can also be used to support component manufacturers. So folks who are producing um, uh, uh, products that are going into light duty passenger vehicles. And I think um, we are starting to see a uh, large amount of interest specifically from the battery and battery material supply chain um, for this transition to electrification that we're seeing from many of the major automakers. So um, uh, a lot of um, lending capacity available through ATVM. Um, ATVM also does not have any application fees. Um, it is low cost financing. So we're looking at um, treasury rates plus a small spread. Um, but a very accessible program, um, and we're still managing uh, approximately a $7 billion loan to Ford um, under uh, the ATVM program today. And then the last program, which is our newest program um, that we uh, received appropriations for just back in um, 2018, I believe, is the Tribal Energy Loan Guarantee Program. So this is a, um, a loan guarantee program uh, we are not able to provide direct loans through the federal finance bank, so we would just be guaranteeing debt issued by a commercial lender for projects that have a majority ownership with a federally recognized tribe or Alaska Native Corporation. Um, we do not have the same innovative and greenhouse gas reduction requirements for our tribal energy loan guarantee program that we do for the Title 17 program, so things like um, uh, commercially available um, uh, solar and wind um, and other renewable energy technologies that are widely deployed may also be um, eligible under the Tribal Energy Loan Guarantee Program. We're also doing some work to um, uh, reflect some process improvements to this program. Um, that are underway uh, with many folks on staff uh, looking closely at this program. We're starting to see a lot of interest, and uh, we do work very closely with um, Director Wahila Johns in the Office of Indian Energy at the Department of Energy um, to provide technical assistance to tribes who are looking for it um, to help with project development um, that would potentially um, uh, then be ready to engage with us on um, the debt side for, for projects. We can go to the next slide, please. Great. Um, so as I mentioned, we, um, are, we have a lot of flexibility. Um, we can provide direct loans um, through the Federal Finance Bank. We can guarantee um, a commercial debt we can um, provide long tenors. So for all of our programs, we can provide um, between 25 and 30 years um, of tenor. Uh, it's usually going to be tied to the useful life of an asset. Um, but um, in some cases, we have projects that have long-term PPAs and we're able to provide um, similar terms for our, our tenor and our transactions. Um, we can support projects that are looking at project finance. Um, structured corporate transactions, uh, corporate and warehouse, warehousing lines. So a lot of flexibility in the financing structures that we are able to support. Um, and we can either be a, the sole lender on a project or we can co-lend. Um, we cannot be so subordinate to any other debt, um, but we can co-lend um, with, uh, with other financiers. Um, and then uh, uh, just to say that in terms of the amount of capacity, so we do have this $40 billion um, uh, that breaks down in various different ways as I just walked through. Um, but the sm smallest loan we've issued to date um, is approximately $43 million. Um, and then our largest um, has been uh, 5.9. So there is a lot of variability um, in terms of the size and scale and scope of the projects that we're able to support. 
Um, and I think that's what makes our office so unique um, and exciting for project developers that are looking to work with us. Um, so we can go to the next slide. Great. Um, the other thing that uh, I think um, we're uh, beginning to um, uh, communicate and, and share with project developers is the full spectrum of projects that we're able to support um, in terms of technology commercialization. So I think in many cases, when folks think about LPO, if they've heard of us, um, a lot of folks haven't heard of us, but if they have, um, they think of us as um, providing loan guarantees for first of a kind um, uh, technology deployments. Um, so unproven technologies that are being built in the United States, um, and there's um, a lot of risk involved with these new technologies potentially. Um, that is true. We can support um, those uh, technologies that are on the far left side of this bridge to bankability. Um, but we can also uh, support projects that are all along this bridge. So we can also support um, subsequent deployments of that first of a kind technology. So maybe, maybe projects two and three um, that have had uneven deployment. Um, they're still um, building projects solely with equity, but they're looking to bring on debt. Um, we're looking, uh, we're able to support projects that are scaling up. So maybe they've deployed um, a, a pilot or a small demo, um, but they're looking to um, go bigger um, or with more units. Um, that's something that we're also able to support. And then um, on the left, uh, sorry, the right side of the bridge, um, we can also um, uh, provide financing for projects that um, uh, may be uncomfortable for commercial lenders to participate in. And these are the projects where we would really be looking at co-lending options so that we're able to work with our private sector partners to familiarize them with the structures and with the technologies that DOE has gained comfort uh, with so that they can then go on and hopefully successfully finance future projects at a similar size and scale. So we, we're able to fit in um, along uh, this entire bridge to bankability. Um, on the uh, left side, even before first of a kind, that pre-deployment, um, that's where some of the other offices at the Department of Energy would be engaged more on the research development first pilot um, side of things. Um, and so many opportunities at DOE, but this is um, a good illustration of where the loan programs office can fit in. We can go to the next slide, please. Uh, so um, we're we're here. We want to hear from you. We want to hear from um, project developers. We want to hear from um, government agencies and entities that are interested in um, uh, exploring pathways to build new clean energy and manufacturing projects in the United States. And we have a whole team. Um, at the Loan Programs Office that are waiting to hear from you, that may be reaching out to you um, to learn more about your projects and what your needs may be. Um, there is absolutely no fee or um, cost except your time and energy and coming to talk to us um, and ask questions about our process and learn more about how we can be supportive of what folks are looking to, to build in their communities. Um, we have recently brought on a tremendous team of industry experts um, with a variety of different backgrounds in um, technologies like nuclear, um, uh, uh, long duration storage, transmission, sustainable aviation fuels, um, virtual power plants, um, batteries and electric vehicles, EV charging, you name it, um, we have someone to talk to. So we hope that um, folks will um, take the opportunity to reach out to us. Um, I'm happy to speak to anyone and point them in the right direction of other folks on our team who are um, really able to be those account managers along the process um, to help them navigate what we need to be able to successfully underwrite our transactions. But um, I think the message that I really want to leave everyone with today is that we are here, we are open for business, and we are very excited about getting this $40 billion in loan authority out the door for projects that are going to help us reach these ambitious and necessary decarbonization goals. 
So um, we'll pause there, happy to um, answer any questions. But again, thank you so much for this opportunity to speak with you all today. Sydney, great information and, and thank you. Just really good uh, presentation. <clears throat> we have uh, at this time, one question from Lynn Heller, um, but uh, we are going to take questions at the end. I encourage everybody to use the Q&A um, chat if you, at the bottom of your screens, if you have any questions. And again, after we get through um, all of our uh, panelists, we will then turn to the Q&A session and, and start going through these questions. So again, thank you, Sydney. Great information. So next up on the agenda, we have Eric Kaufman to provide an overview of state incentives. Eric Kaufman is Director of Programs at the Maryland Energy Administration, where he leads the program team in the development and implementation of a broad portfolio of energy incentive programs, ranging from solar to wind, energy efficiency, um, transportation electrification, microgrids, among others. Uh, these programs are funded by the Strategic Energy Investment Fund, uh, mainly derived from uh, the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, or REGI, which I mentioned earlier. Prior to joining the uh, team at uh, MEA, Eric led the Office of Energy and Sustainability at, in Montgomery County, where he was responsible for the sustainability and energy performance of county operations. In addition, Eric is a certified public manager, certified energy manager, and a certified energy procurement professional. Needless to say, I'm delighted to have Eric on, uh, on, on, on our team at MEA leading our program. So Eric, please take it away. Absolutely, and thank you for the good morning, everyone, and thank you for the introduction, Chris. So I'm here to talk about the uh, Maryland Energy Administration's diverse range of programs. I suspect a lot of folks in the audience already work with us. And then we're looking very forward to all those who are not currently working with, with us to inform them of what we have available and engage them during this discussion and after. I think we get to the next slide, please. So a little more background, Chris provided some background at the beginning, but a little more background on MEA and how this connects to programs. You, we are your state energy office and we are responsible for policy as well as programs. Our headline is clean energy reliability and affordability. But when you start to unpack that, when you really unpack those three areas, you get into a large number of other objectives that we have embedded in all of our programs. So we're actively engaging on decarbonization, resiliency, equity and inclusivity, clean energy, the clean energy economy and the workforce, innovation and market transformation. And last but certainly not least is that emphasis on energy efficiency. Next slide, please. So we could talk all day about MEA programs. I'll, I'll spare you that. Um, but I do want to make sure you have sort of that fundamental knowledge of what we have in and some guidance on how to navigate it. But just, so MEA is the administrator of the Strategic Energy Investment Fund. As Chris noted, as predominantly, has a number of funding sources that have gone into it, but is predominantly funded by the um, allowance auctions of the Re Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative. Our programs break into a number of areas. So we have programs that provide rebates. We'll talk a little bit more about those, but they're very much customer front, um, customer facing, a lot of um, residential offices, but there are commercial opportunities. There are, and those are our highest volume programs. We have grants, which cover some, everything from some, you know, some sort of, let's get a solar project to some really innovative cutting edge things. We have loans. We have the Jane Lawton Loan Program, which I'll talk a little more about as we get into the meat of this discussion. But we also, you know, provide, you know, we see financing as a core and critical tool, which I know a number of the other presenters today have touched on. Technical support, you know, it's not just about funding and money for us. It's about engaging you, um, providing support, providing access to our subject matter expertise and that of our um, very, very proficient staff, as well as access to a number of consultants and others we have on board who can help 
define really good projects. And then partnerships. You know, we, we are working very closely with um, a lot of local governments, a lot of non-governmental organizations, the industry, to how we can partner to do even greater things. And then I'll talk a minute about, you know, about the uh, about tax credits. While we don't issue those tax credits for energy storage in particular, we are the entity that verifies the applications. And all in all, we're distributing about, and for this year, for our fiscal year 22, we're distributing in the order of $40 million across the state, across all of our, all of our collective programs. And we, I can't resist saying it, but um, on this slide, it says first, Maryland's first in everything, of course. Next slide, please. So starting with energy efficiency, as I mentioned earlier, energy efficiency is an essential part of our portfolio. You know, it's the starting point. We love renewables as well, but we should always look for the most efficient buildings and the most efficient vehicles. So we have a whole portfolio of programs. We have our low to moderate income energy efficiency program, which provides grants to non to, lo to um, local governments and um, nonprofits to be able to reach out and help retrofit homes low to moderate income Marylanders to be more efficient, to reduce that energy cost, which can be a dis disproportionate portion of their um, budget in their life. So that is one of our most popular programs and consistently oversubscribed, but we still, as always, encourage people to bring us every application they can. We are gonna to continue to keep pushing resources into that program because it is one of the most important and really gets to that equity part of the equation. Uh, commercial, industrial, agriculture, energy efficiency. Our, this program provides grants for energy efficiency improvements. Um, we typically see a lot of interest from the manufacturing sector. We've partnered very closely with the Regional Manufacturing Institute of Maryland, to, where they provide technical support and audit services. And then we can back that up with grants that can help defray the cost of those projects. We're seeing a much larger interest in the wake of, and hopefully <laughs> the continued wake of, um, COVID on HVAC improvements to improve indoor air quality and the safety for residents and employees. So that's a program that's out there. We would love to see continued engagement from the agriculture sector as well. And just to sort of capstone it, our purpose of that program is not to overlap Empower, it's to supplement. So for those projects that where the Empower incentives are not sufficient enough to get someone to say yes to a project, we have a grant to help push the um, needle a little further. Data centers. We provide grants for data center energy efficiency improvements, growing sector of our economy, and it's one we want to support. And data centers, by the nature of their operations, are energy intensive. And, you know, this is an opportunity to get technology in place that can reduce consumption. The Jane Lawton Energy Efficiency Loan Program. We provide loans. We provide loans to public entities, state government, as well as local, as, um, as, well as local governments, and then the private sector as well. And this program is not meant to supplant private sources of capital, it's meant to supplement. So what we're doing is, you know, by having our, our capital, which has a much lower interest rate than many other sources, you help become part of a capital stack to get comprehensive programs, um, projects moving forward. So that, that program provides currently a no interest loan for state entities and then 1% for private entities. Uh, Maryland Energy Infrastructure Program. This program is funded by proceeds from um, the OPGAS um, WGL merger and is helping to address gas use at the end user. Um, one of the most powerful examples we've seen is we, there's a uh, market in Baltimore that participated in the program two years ago where they were able to retrofit their heating, heating um, system with a very efficient very, very efficient natural gas system that was able to reduce their operating cost by well, well into the six digits, which being a local market, a community, a community facing entity, they are able to roll into supporting their efforts and employing folks and helping to deliver quality foods to an area that doesn't have, in a city that doesn't have a lot of other options. So, and that's a great example. Um, this year, we're very focused on resiliency as to where can we use some of those funds to bolster, bolster the amount of generation to support critical infrastructure. So as, as well as, as, well as um, building such as schools, 
which may need additional funds for retrofitting those, those aging heating, heating systems. And the program also provides funding um, for natural gas, natural gas expansion, very targeted, but it's out there for, it's out there for um, getting gas to folks who currently don't have access to gas or may have hindered their economy. And then local governments um, mentioned technical assistance. We provide technical assistance through a number of venues. We are wrapping up a project that was funded by the Department of Energy, where we work with jurisdictions across the state and some of Virginia too. It was a, it was a, a multi-state effort, but to provide guidance and help them calculate and assess opportunities for upgrading street lighting. We produced one of the first of its kind for the state uh, market assessments. It really gets to what's needed to move street lights. And even though the DOE program in, is coming to a sunset in the, the, near, the foreseeable future for that program, the lessons learned for that program and the relationships we've built, we're gonna continue to support and um, try and move that really what seems in many ways to be straightforward, low-hanging fruit towards successful um, projects. Next slide. So one of our biggest in terms, I mentioned we have 20 programs, is um, our clean energy and resiliency portfolio. So we currently um, offer a number of programs. You know, when folks come up to me and they say, hey, Eric, I have an idea and I wanna do this. I'm like, oh, we have a program for that. <laughs> in many cases, that's true. Um, though we do love to hear all the ideas folks will bring us. But um, we have our clean energy rebate program, which provides um, rebates for solar geothermal, as well as um, wood and pellet stoves. So we're touching all parts of the Maryland economy in, in, in a consumer focused rebate. And that program is one of our longest standing and highest volume. Um, we're very passionate about the public facility solar grant, solar grant program. This follows on a commitment that um, Governor Hogan had made several years ago to inject funds into getting solar and public facilities where they could be very visible and help with education as well as defraying um, the energy, you know, the grid supplied energy use of those facilities. And so we have basically two, two pieces we, with this program. We provide grants for the um, incentivize the actual projects. So the smaller ones, we put, because there's not as many options for private financing, we provide a larger grant. And then for the bigger ones, we, we um, provide a smaller grant knowing that they can leverage power purchase agreements and other mechanisms. But we also provide technical assistance to local government. So when a local government or university or community college comes to us and says, I got a portfolio of buildings and I don't know which ones to put solar on. We've got, we've got resources on hand to be able to help them with that assessment. Very simple um, MOU, straightforward. They provide us data. We provide them access to Maryland Environmental Services um, who can run that analysis for them and provide them a report that's comprehensive. So, and then the list goes on. Solar canopies, we provide yeah, we provide grants for solar canopies, great dual use. You'll see in this in this slide, there's a photo of the IKEA project. That's one of two that IKEA has done, where they have done a canopy system that shades the parking, includes electric vehicle charging. People love it. You're generating clean energy, and they've got core cars to, to get in and out of. Uh, combined heat and power, where we incentivize the insulation of systems that take natural gas and convert it to electricity and thermal energy for use very locally, very efficient way to generate electricity. It also adds to resiliency because many of those assets can remain online in power facilities while during a grid outage. They have to configure them a certain way, but many of them have that capability and we're encouraging more of that. And that ties very closely to our Resilient Maryland program. Things like combined heat and power can be complicated. And Many, many of the folks who participate in our program are like, where do I start? So we, so two years ago, we launched a program to provide funds for feasibility assessments to, ident to help those who have assets that are going to be very valuable and sensitive to power outages, are going to be valuable to the community during an outage, to be able to do the feasibility analysis to figure out how to incorporate distributed energy into their operations to be able to support them during an outage. Bolsters are state resiliency, typical, Typical participants of the program are low to moderate income housing communities where the vulnerabilities may be very substantial and the opportunities to go somewhere else during an emergency may be limited. Um, vulnerable industrial sectors where uh, think about um, sort of advanced agriculture and greenhouses where you know, you've got an opportunity, you need to keep margins and costs very low, but you also need to have that benefit of resiliency. And then of course, critical infrastructure 
and um, key amenities that are essential to supporting people during an emergency. So that's one of our programs and all of these programs are available, available this year. So um, low to moderate income community solar, this has been one which has been literally, literally an explosion of projects uh, just in, is that we've had, um, we provide an incentive to help defray the cost of the power from those community solar assets to the end, end use customer, the low to moderate income end use subscriber. And the grant we provide buys down that cost, gives them a lower cost, make sure that they get a savings when they subscribe and makes that more accessible. And we have seen just continued and growing interest um, in, 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 in this, um, this program. That one did recently close for applications and we're reviewing them now, but um, just an incredible turnout. Uh, resiliency hubs, you know, so those assets in a community that think about, think about when the power's out to a more family community or, and you know, we're going, you can't get those, you can't charge your cell phones, you can't power up your medical equipment, you may have perishable medications, what do you do? And if you don't have the option to relocate, um, or it's such a widespread emergency, how do we support those folks to, to ensure that they have those basic services? That's where the Resiliency Hub comes into play. So we provide a grant. Um, they often go to congregations, um, also um, very popular, a lot of interest from apartment, um, apartment complexes and multifamily housing to be able to create that sort of solar and battery powered hub that can keep people comfortable, support those basic needs until more comprehensive help can arrive. And um, we saw, actually saw some similar projects down south, um, our, our friends in New Orleans, and you know, there were some similar efforts that were actually able to help a lot of people ride through some pretty significant emergencies with the recent hurricane. And then um, offshore wind, we provide funds for capital investment for businesses entering the offshore wind, wind economy. And we also provide grants for um, to train that workforce that's going to engage those projects and both and you know, contribute to that what is truly a regional economy. And then I mentioned earlier the energy storage tax credit. That's an opportunity for tax credits for energy storage. And all these programs, when you think about everything, they can stack. So you think about, okay, we want to do solar plus efficiency plus, you know, plus resiliency. We can add those things together. Next slide. Uh oh, next, there we go. And bringing us to a landing here pretty, pretty shortly. So the other portfolio we have is clean transportation fuels and then our broader partnership efforts. So similar to in ways we have rebate programs for, um, for clean energy, we also have rebate programs for electric vehicle supply and equipment charging infrastructure, <laughs> quite simply. And that's a high volume program. We provide we provide a rebate, a lot of residential participation, but also commercial as well, getting chargers in places where people frequent. So think thinking like parking garages, retail, retail um, centers, et cetera. The clean fuels incentive program is, is essentially the vehicle portion of that. So that program provides grants for fleet operators and others who are purchasing medium and heavy duty vehicles. And so we're defraying some of the, some of the premium cost of that electric or um, CNG or propane vehicle. We have an emphasis on vehicles this year, knowing that we need to grow the number of vehicles. And we're seeing a movement in the industry to where infrastructure often comes in an agreement between that, um, that entity and their provider when they purchase the vehicle. So strong emphasis vehicles, uh, Maryland Smart Energy Communities is our primary partnership program for working with local governments and municipalities. We're working with about 80 of them. Program actually does more than just provide grants. We work with them and say, okay, to be designated ways communities, you have to pick two or three priorities, energy efficiency, clean energy or transportation, and then you define your baseline, you do the analysis, you're getting those fundamental policies in place, and then you have access to grants that can help you actually get that steel in the ground and um, implement the projects. And then we are working with many, many others. Um, a lot of our work goes a little, is, is not seen. We, you know, we have fund, there are funds going as strategic energy investment fund support um, improvements on the way up wastewater facilities, there 
for energy efficiency and renewable energy. We provide support to a large number of entities that are working with us. So I know I've covered a lot of ground in a short amount of time. My number one message is reach out to us. Um, talk to us. We are open. I think I heard um, Sydney say the same thing about their programs. And with that, one more slide for contact information. There we go. And where to find me. And please visit our website. Um, and, and please don't be shy. We are here to work with you. Well, thanks, Eric. <clears throat> a, lot of, a lot of intel and, and folks when, when Eric says we have a program for that. You know, um, I, I experience the same, uh, the same thing that Eric does when somebody comes up and starts talking to me and, you know, is passionate and talking about, uh, you know, a great idea they have. And, and we say, well, you know what, we got a, we got a program for that. So, um, and if we don't, um, our, our funding sources uh, allows us to have a lot of flexibility to develop, to listen and get feedback and develop programs that would fit your needs. So again, uh, thank you, Eric, and a reminder to everybody um, to place your, your questions in the Q&A uh, section of, of uh, this platform. So next up, we have David Brown. David Brown <clears throat> is Senior Vice President of Federal Government Affairs and Public Policy for Exelon Corporate Corporation. David has been with Exelon and his predecessor, Pepco Energy Company, for more than a few years. Um, David serves as Exelon's primary liaison with Congress and federal agencies and works actively with national trade associations representing the electric, natural gas, and nuclear energy industries. Prior to joining Exelon, David worked at the American Nuclear Energy Council He's a graduate from Hamden Sydney College in Virginia and received his Juris Doctor degree with honors from Georgetown University of Law Center. David, I turn it over to you. Super. Uh, thanks, Chris, and good morning. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to be here with you all today. Um, Exelon is uh, the largest generator of carbon free energy in the country. Uh, so, this is a critically important issue uh, to us. We also have the, lar the lowest carbon intensity uh, among large generators. We actually uh, emit uh, less than 100 pounds of carbon per megawatt hour, which is about a fifth of uh, our nearest large competitor. So uh, again, excited to be here today and, and talk to you all. Uh, as you all probably know, we have six utilities uh, located in Chicago, Philadelphia, uh, Washington, D.C., Wilmington, Delaware, Atlantic City and of course Baltimore. Uh, in Maryland, we've got 6,200 employees uh, between Pepco, BGE, and Constellation. Uh, those companies serve 2.4 million customers uh, in Maryland, and we own and operate the two largest sources of carbon free energy in the state at Calvert Cliffs and Conowingo, uh, as well as a number of uh, wind facilities. So uh, ever since Exelon was created in uh, 2000, we have been leaders in climate advocacy. Uh, in fact, the company was actually created uh, with carbon in mind. It brought together two of the cleanest generating fleets in the country uh, to create Exelon. And we have long advocated for a price on carbon that recognizes the value of all clean generation. Uh, we are members of the Climate Leadership Council which has called for a carbon tax and dividend approach with a carbon border adjustment. Uh, it calls for a $40 uh, per ton tax on, on CO2 uh, with 100% of the revenue raised going back to households in the form of quarterly dividend checks. And uh, those dividends keep about 70 to 80% of households uh, harmless or actually better off uh, once you factor in uh, the increased energy costs that they, that they might see. Uh, the other great thing is that the carbon border adjustment makes most U.S. manufacturers instantly competitive uh, against the Chinese, Russian, and Indian uh, competitors. Uh, so there's a lot to be said for a carbon tax. Uh, we've also supported other approaches that include a clean energy standard or the clean electricity performance program that's been proposed by the administration. Uh, we've also promoted a production tax credit for the existing nuclear fleet. 
Uh, nuclear power provides about 20% of our electricity nationally, but it accounts for half of the carbon-free energy in the country. And the last thing that we want to uh, do if we're striving to achieve these aggressive carbon goals is uh, take existing clean resources offline. It just puts us further behind uh, in our efforts to, to reach those goals. Um, so interestingly, all three of these concepts are in play as part of the reconciliation bill under consideration by Congress. Uh, and I'm happy to get into uh, uh, that Q&A. We think that, but we also understand that every company is kind of uniquely situated and that details matter. So we are hopeful that legislation uh, takes a balanced approach that addresses concerns over reliability, affordability, uh, job creation and preservation, and the impacts on uh, coal communities uh, in particular. Uh, I know that a lot of those criteria are seen by some as an excuse not to support aggressive climate uh, legislation, uh, but I can assure you that we're pushing for the most ambitious program that we can get through the Senate, uh, which is uh, a delicate balance these days. We also think that innovation is gonna be a key to achieving our clean energy goals, which is why we're very supportive of federal R&D efforts. And that's why we've uh, invested in a few different areas uh, with an eye on winter. So gas plant technology that has shown significant promise uh, for being both economic uh, and deployable in the near term, probably in the next five years or so. We have a pilot uh, plant uh, down in Texas right now uh, that is uh, getting online and uh, again, shows a lot of promise. Um, it's a unique technology uh, that injects uh, a high purity uh, oxygen stream uh, with natural gas and the byproducts are basically uh, a clean stream of uh, CO2 that can be captured and water. Uh, we are also an investor in Volta, which is a battery storage company uh, that is aimed at uh, commercializing the most promising technologies coming out of the national labs. Uh, as many of you have seen, uh, one of the big challenges getting technology from the drawing board to the commercial stage is kind of that valley of death when they come out of the labs and uh, really need the support from um, businesses that, uh, that can help deploy those technologies. And then Constellation also has a, a group called Constellation Technology Ventures. It's an in-house venture capital fund uh, that was an early investor in Proterra, uh, who many of you all are familiar with as an electric bus company, uh, ChargePoint, and other energy technology uh, companies that are focused on climate solutions. And then most recently, we announced a 10-year, $20 million uh, 2C2I program uh, to invest in uh, and cultivate innovative startups that are focused on advancing climate change mitigation, adaptation, and resiliency efforts uh, with a focus on social equity and economic prosperity. So we're really excited about that, that effort to spur uh, solutions uh, to the climate challenge. Uh, so that's kind of it in a nutshell in terms of um, advocacy at the federal level. Again, happy to get into the logistics and, and kind of the outlook for uh, carbon legislation moving forward during Q&A. But uh, Chris, let me turn it back over to you. Thank you very much. Really good intel, um, David, and appreciate it. Again, folks, um, please use the Q&A function um, on your the the bottom of your screen to um, post questions. So last, but certainly not least on our agenda is Lee Peterson. Uh, Lee Peterson is a senior manager at Cohen Resnick Project. Um, uh, I'm sorry, Cohen Resnick's project financing and consulting practice and serves as the firm's government liaison. In this capacity, he close, closely monitors the impact of legislation uh, developments such as a U.S. Uh, infrastructure plan could have on the firm's clients. Lee also advises private companies and federal, state, and local governments on public tax incentive policy. 
including policy with respect to the federal investment tax credit and the production tax credit. His clients include Fortune 100 companies, government and not-for-profit organizations, and renewable energy-sponsored companies, project developers, and tax equity investor investors. Lee, you're on. Great. Thank you so much, Chris. And thanks also uh, to Catherine uh, for inviting me here today. Uh, as Chris indicated, I'm a tax lawyer by trade. I'm employed by Cone Resnick, which of course is a national public accounting firm. And I spent a lot of time with some of the more um, prominent federal tax incentives dealing with renewable energy. But, um, you know, it's really kind of a strange thing. And if you could maybe move to the next slide, uh, even though federal tax incentives are exactly that, um, federal tax incentives have state income tax consequences and even entities that don't um, pay tax like nonprofits and governments have to really be aware of the federal tax rules in order to get even for themselves the maximum economic benefit that these federal tax incentives provide. So what I wanted to do today is just to give everybody on the call what I'm calling an advance alert because as the prior speaker indicated, we're going through a reconciliation infrastructure uh, debate right now. And the reconciliation bill has a number of, of proposals which are probably likely to make it through, particularly as it, rates, as it relates to the production tax credit and the investment tax credit. And some of these are truly new changes, things we've never seen before in the tax code that have direct relevance to uh, tax exempts and governments, uh, federal, state, and local governments. So I wanted to kind of put these things on everybody's radar. Um, both from the governmental side, as well as um, with respect to um, the developers or the project sponsors who would be doing deals with the particular uh, municipalities. So um, I normally, you know, I'm a tax lawyer and I don't have like a problem dealing with tax code citations and I normally don't like to provide them in situations like this. But in this case, I wanted folks on the, on the webinar to have um, the citation so that you would know where to look when you started to, to deal with these issues. So um, to make a long story short, the, the reconciliation proposal we have right now for the uh, clean energy production tax credit, which of course is distinct from the, the nuclear production tax credit and the investment tax credit, um, the main proposal is just to extend these things. You know, Currently the proposal is to extend them for 10 years and whether it's 10 or eight or five, we'll find out shortly. But I'm not really going to talk about the extension because honestly, it's just more of the same. We've seen extensions before and, and there's really not a lot new there. But there are some new things that I think you need to be thinking about because if they become law, it's going to impact some of the things you need to think about or maybe even, even worry about. And one of the unique and frankly positive changes that is being proposed uh, specifically as it relates to the investment tax credit is a, a change to the tax exempt use rules. Now currently Internal Revenue Code section 50B three and four basically says that if you're a tax exempt or a government, whether that's uh, state or local, it doesn't really matter. Um, you will not get an investment tax credit if you own or lease um, a system from someone who is a taxable taxpayer. So these rules 50B3 and 50B4 basically explain why we haven't seen a massive amount of municipal uh, renewable energy, particularly solar. Because if the government owns it, the tax credits are canceled. And if you try to let someone else own it and lease the system from them, their tax credits are also canceled. Now it is true that you know tax planning is, is a, a precise art and we can sometimes create taxable blocker corporations to avoid this problem or in some cases use a, a section 7701E service contract to avoid uh, the ownership and lease issue. And in cases where power purchase agreements are allowed by law, you can usually do a PPA, which means that the municipality or tax exempt would just buy the power from the owner of say the solar system. But we still have states like Alabama and other places where power purchase agreements are illegal or at least third party power purchase agreements are illegal. So. Right now, the tax exempt use rules really create a lot of problems and, and severely dampen the ability of tax exempts 
and municipals to do renewable energies and get the same economic value that a taxable company would, because again, the taxable company can get the tax credit and the tax depreciation, all of these things lower the sort of the net overall cost. And so what's really interesting now is that we have this new proposal in the reconciliation bill, which would change the tax exempt use rules and would basically allow governments um, and or tax exempts to not get the tax credit, but to elect a tax refund in lieu of a tax credit. And it would eliminate the tax exempt use rule that would otherwise prevent that from happening. So we have a potential here, if this new provision passes, that um, tax exempts of pretty much all kinds and, and governments of pretty much all kinds, maybe with the exception of the federal government, um, because it wouldn't necessarily make sense for the federal government to pay itself um, a tax refund, but basically an opportunity to um, start owning directly and getting the same economic benefit like the 30% ITC benefit. And so that is truly uh, a game changer. And that's something that I wanted folks to be aware of, particularly in jurisdictions that don't allow power purchase agreements or in situations where the service contract um, or a lease would, would not be allowed. So that's the first item I wanted to put on everybody's radar screen is that pay attention to that because if you just sort of think in your mind, the sheer number of tax exempt properties, whether they're hospitals, nursing homes and schools, and then add to that every state and local uh, government facility, police, fire, et cetera. There's a huge opportunity here to do things um, with clean energy, uh, particularly solar, uh, that you really didn't do before because the tax code was in the way. And so that's a huge um, benefit. Another area which I know is important based on what Eric was saying is the area of low income housing. Now the federal tax code has a, a tax credit to stimulate investment in development and building of multifamily and other affordable housing. And that's under section 42 of the Internal Revenue Code. It's known as the Low Income Housing Tax Credit or as it's listed here, LIHTC. And it turns out that you can actually stack to use Eric's term, the section 42 affordable housing tax credit with the section 48 investment tax credit. So we're seeing low income housing multifamily units being done with solar and ground source. And just yesterday I had a client who was doing both solar and ground source heating and cooling on his LIHTC project. But because of these uh, tax accounting rules, there, there's another rule specific to the investment tax credit, which requires what's called the basis reduction, which means you have to calculate the amount of the tax credit and you take half that amount and you reduce the amount of depreciation you can claim on that asset. And when you, when you combine the two credits, the investment tax credit and the LIHTC credit, when you make the reduction for the investment tax credit, you also are forced to make this corresponding reduction to the affordable housing tax credit. And that lowers the amount of money that the developer has to actually build the affordable housing project. So one of the things that's really interesting in the reconciliation proposal is to amend the tax code to eliminate that basis reduction in the case of renewable energy on section 42 affordable housing. And so that's really something um, truly important because it will eliminate a whole host of problems that uh, developers are experiencing and in some cases are choosing not to do solar on affordable housing just because the reduction in the tax credit uh, reduces the amount of capital that they end up with to build the project. So that's something for those on the affordable side to, um, to keep an eye on. And then um, one thing, and then we'll switch over to the next slide here, is just to uh, make a reminder here that um, federal grants, there's another rule for affordable housing that basically causes uh, the tax credit for affordable housing to be reduced uh, to the extent that certain federal grants are involved. So this rule I'm talking about, about the basis reduction, wouldn't solve the federal grant issue. But um, once again, it, it's a big improvement from what we had before. So um, again, just a heads up on those two uh, important items. And what I'd like to do next is if we could move on to the next slide, please um, make a few comments, uh, particularly for folks on the governmental side. And also as a heads up to the private sector who would be working with governments on clean energy. Um, what I'd like to talk about is sort of some simple things that, that people forget and sometimes in smaller municipalities, they just literally neglect to do. But as we, as we consider the possibility 
that the reconciliation legislation is going to be pushing uh, trillions of dollars into the clean energy sector. And, and those dollars are going to go to the agencies, federal agencies and state agencies, and all of that money is going to sort of show up in your locality somehow. We're going to see either expanded existing programs uh, for things like grants or new programs. And so to make a, a long story short, the IRS requires the, the person who makes a grant, who you know gives you the money to file in IRS form 1099G. Um, and that's important because it's a requirement for the person who's making the grant, but it's usually a sort of a shock and a surprise to the people who get the grant who really don't know or have never been told that, that grants are generally taxable at the federal level. Um, you know, you think of a grant as being free money, uh, and it is for all purposes other than tax purposes. And so, you know, heads up to both grantors and grantees that grants are generally taxable under Internal Revenue Code Section 61. And so, um, you know, once they're taxable at the federal level, they can also be taxed again at the state level. So that the combined tax drag on a grant can, at the end of the day, make your grant, um, you know, 30% less than what you thought it was. And so obviously everybody needs to be aware of that. And whether that means uh, folks gross up grants in order to pay the tax or what we see uh, is a successful play in many cases is that say like a tax exempt housing authority will get a grant for affordable housing. And then rather than re-grant the money to the affordable housing project, uh, the tax exempt entity will loan the money. And because a loan is not a grant, you know, albeit it may have a low interest rate, you can increase the efficiency and multiply the dollars available for use if you eliminate the tax drag. So I wanted to make that point um, sort of available to everybody uh, if we see a lot of this reconciliation money come down the pike. Now, there is a provision in the tax code, federal code, Internal Revenue Code Section 136, that deals with rebates or subsidies from public utilities. And it's uh, on the one hand, it's a very generous rule. It says that if you get um, an energy efficiency subsidy from a public utility with respect to a dwelling unit, so again, we're back to multifamily uh, family uh, in environments, low income housing, maybe even you in your own residential setting involving a dwelling unit. If you get one of those kinds of rebates, subsidies or grants, the federal tax code mandates that you exclude that from income, which means it's tax free. It is actually free money. This overrides the general rule. But unfortunately, what it also does is it says that if you take the income, take the money and you don't pay tax on it, you must reduce the depreciation and the basis. And again, what that means is you lower the amount available for a tax credit. So if you get a, a grant with a, from a public utility with respect to a dwelling unit and you buy solar, you get the money for free, but then when you make the reduction for the um, 136 rebate, you actually lose tax credits, which are worth 30 cents on the dollar versus the deduction, which is worth like maybe 20 cents. So you end up losing on a net basis if you take that money and you're not aware of it. So um, we spend a lot of time trying to work through that. And I wanted to make sure that I'm not seeing any change to that rule under the reconciliation package. So again, that's only in the limited category of public utility subsidies and only with respect to dwelling units. That rule is not applicable generally to commercial situations, but um, in, it, it can be again, if it's a housing situation. And then this one other piece is, is, is really interesting and I wanted to highlight it because the last time we saw massive federal stimulus for clean energy was under the Obama administration, the Stimulus Act. And we had um, uh, programs that were specifically designed to help governments increase the energy efficiency of their uh, facilities. And there is a federal tax deduction under 179 capital D of the code which allows governments to assign, literally give away the ta federal tax deduction for the investment in energy efficiency to the company who designed the system for the government. And that sounds wonderful. So you're a big government, you just spent 40 million on energy efficiency improvements and you got you know, $40 million worth of federal tax deductions that you can't use because you're a government and you don't pay tax. And here you can assign that to the designer of a system 
And because you're assigning them a $40 million tax deduction, presumably they would reduce the price to you and everybody would benefit and tax code would operate as intended. Uh, but guess what? Uh, you got to make that assignment. So then you got to ask who in your government understands these rules? Who in your government can approve this assignment? Uh, who is going to have the form? What does the form look like? Who's going to assign it? Who's going to cut the check? We found hundreds of millions of dollars of tax savings were, were wasted just because uh, governments uh, weren't either familiar with these rules or couldn't get the infrastructure, the bureaucratic infrastructure in place to allow these deductions to be not only transferred to the designers, but would have had an economic price or cost reduction to the municipality. So um, one more heads up on that front. So I know that was a lot of technical sort of wonky stuff, but it's stuff you really don't see written about anywhere. You know, some of these issues you might uh, know about if you're my client and I'm walking you through a deal. But given the nature of the folks on the call, um, I thought, you know, it'd be worth putting this out there for discussion. So um, I think with that, I'll just wrap it up and be available for questions and, and, and thank everybody for their time. Lee, that <clears throat> it was just phenomenal. A lot of, lot of information to absorb and you know, uh, folks, I've, I've spoken to Lee twice um, and, and I've learned something, you know, both times I've, I've uh, had a conversation with him. He's just a, a you know, ball of knowledge. And um, just to, you know, piggyback on one of his uh, topics or comments about the taxable nature of grants. We, we see that, we deal with that, and um, it is quite a shock to um, people when, when we say, hey, we're giving you this money, and by the way, it's income, so it's tax. So, you know, it, 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 it takes a lot of people, you know, by surprise, and, you know, it, it, it you know, something we have to deal with. So, um, one, one reminder, folks, if you have questions, um, please put them in the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Um, Sabrina, we have one, um, one polling question coming up. Can you put that up? All right. So, we want to hear from you folks now, um, uh, and we'd like to hear from you about your current project activity. Are you uh, working on a project or projects that could uh, benefit from access to federal and state uh, funding assistance? Please take a moment to select from the options displaying on the screen. Note, you may uh, select more than one option here, so please take a minute and fill this out. All right, we've got a lot of uh, maybe projects under consideration, 47%, um, 29% no, and 24% uh, unsure. So uh, and only have 6% uh, um, awarded funds thus far. So um, there's, there's plenty of uh, funds and, and grants for uh, potential projects, both on the federal and state side that, that we just heard about. So um, we are going to move to our Q&A session uh, currently. Uh, currently we have three, uh, four questions now. Um, first question comes from Lynn Heller to um, uh, Sydney. Um, do you have any plans to open, open up loan or um, guarantee opportunities uh, for small distributed generation projects, particularly particularly innovative projects serving low-income uh, communities. This is uh, a serious financing gap uh, that the market does not address. You are on mute. Off of my phone, but not on the computer. Um, well, thank you so much for the question. Um, 
in short, yes, we are looking at this very, very closely. We're working with project developers for distributed generation projects that are um, uh, looking at how to best serve um, low and moderate income communities and underserved communities. We're already beginning to receive applications um, for these types of projects. We have a tremendous team um, that has recently joined the Loan Programs Office, specifically um, uh, working on these types of projects that are coming to us in a variety of different structures. So um, I think the uh, most direct answer is yes, we are looking to engage, we're looking for ways uh, to support project developers and platforms that are looking to um, reach these communities. And please feel free to reach out to me um, after this event so that I may put you in touch with um, folks like Joe Andronico and Elizabeth Wolf and Jim Barrett, who have joined our team that are working with these project developers today and um, applicants to our programs um, to uh, navigate Title 17. It's something new for us, but we're putting dedicated resources to figuring out how we can um, be involved and support these types of projects. Thank you. Um, let's move to Frank LeBlanc. And this is a, a question uh, to uh, Eric Kaufman, but Lee may have uh, some uh, input on this one as well. Um, how does it work for public school divisions looking at potential tax credits? Would an ESCO have to take a take it to lower overall project cost or are schools eligible? Eric, that was directed to you. Um, yeah, and also it's on the tax side, I'd punt the lead, but I did want to see if we get a little clarification. Is this the 179D that they're referring to? Because uh, in some of my operational experience when you're dealing with an ESP, PC, it's often built into their cash flow analysis. So it's all yeah. stipulated in their lead. You have some. Yeah, issues? yeah. I mean, you're you're on the right track there, Eric. I mean, I guess that's the question. I mean, again, the question asks about a tax credit. My response would be, well, exactly what tax credit are you talking about? Is it a credit? Is it a deduction? Uh, if it's a state and local tax credit, uh, we need to look at the statutory law and see, you know, some of these things are refundable, some of these are transferable, some of them are only available for taxpayers. So if it's a bona fide tax credit, which basically only has value to someone who pays tax, then you would presume it would be the, the ESCO or the EPC or some other uh, taxable company who would, um, assuming you could structure it in a way that it would work that way, that they would take the credit and hopefully pass the savings on to you. So yeah, the devil's in the details. Um, as I said, the one thing that's weird and, and cool about the new proposed federal tax credit is that they're giving you the choice to take cash in lieu, similar to the 1603 grant from days and years ago. Um, so again, we just have to know exactly what, what it is we're dealing with. Um, and, and, and it's interesting, you know, what I said is that you got to worry about state taxation on federal tax credits and the reverse is true too. If you got a state tax credit or thing of value that could require you to add it to your federal taxable income, even if it's only a state tax credit. So depending on the type of credit will determine whether there's a corresponding federal tax consequence to the use of a state tax credit. So the stuff gets really messy, really fast. And at the end of the day, we start with the statute, figure out what it was, analyze it, and then we can get you some sort of an economic answer. But in general, a tax exempt entity would not have any need or ability to take credit um, because they don't pay tax. Um, with one caveat, um, there are some nonprofits, and I don't think this is generally true for governments, but I've never really seen it. Some tax exempts can have taxable activity. They can have unrelated business taxable income. And in that case, you could have a tax exempt entity that owed federal tax and they could use a credit. But those are rare because we usually structure things so that that doesn't happen. But as you recall, I mentioned a thing called the Blocker Corporation, where in order to avoid the tax exempt use rules on the federal energy credit, you'd have the tax exempt entity set up a taxable subsidiary and run the solar equipment 
through that subsidiary, which would be taxable, then if you had that structure, this is where you might use a state tax credit too. So again, really complicated stuff, but we just need to know more about the particular incentive. All right. Um, last question from Abigail Johnson. I believe this is for uh, Sydney. Um, what is the minimum dollar amount for an individual project under the Title 17 program? And what are the typical fees required to vet the technology from the DOE side? Great. Uh, well, thank you so much for the question. There's no minimum um, uh, dollar threshold for the Title 17 program. Um, I think there is um, uh, probably a um, practical minimum that uh, project developers need to um, evaluate for themselves about engaging with the program. I think we did have a slide that shows the smallest project that we have financed to date was approximately $43 million. Um, but uh, for the um, development costs, um, uh, permitting, environmental compliance, uh, seed studies, market analysis, et cetera, um, that developers are going to be engaging in um, to pull their project together. Um, we want to make sure um, that uh, the scope and size of the project is um, uh, correct for our program. In terms of the um, dollar amount for the technical evaluation, because of the changes of the energy in the Energy Act of 2020 to the Title 17 statute, there are no longer um, application fees required as part of a Part 1 analysis for the Title 17 program, and that is when there is the preliminary um, technical eligibility and greenhouse gas um, life cycle analysis that's conducted by the program. Um, so there's no longer that charge. Um, you can just submit your application. We will be able to conduct the technical eligibility review and life cycle greenhouse gas analysis without an application fee. We will look again at the technology um, uh, in a part two application. And there is no longer a fee um, due when a part two application is submitted. So this is part of the changes um, that passed in December that we've been implementing um, and has been a real benefit to, to our applicants. So hopefully that helps answer the question. Well, thank you so much. I think it, it, it does. And um, that was our last question and we are out of time. And so I would like to thank our panelists um, for all the great information that you've provided. A lot to chew on. Um, and uh, I'm sure that uh, there'll be plenty of follow-up. So with that, I will turn it over to Kathy Magruder. Thank you, Chris, and thanks for moderating. What a fantastic information-packed session. Um, I'm sure we'll get lots of views of this session after the fact. Uh, we want to thank our panelists for their time today. Um, as you should know, we have two more sessions left in the series. On October 12th, we'll be featuring workforce readiness for the advanced energy economy. And then on the 18th, a discussion of innovation and advanced energy and carbon emission reduction, cutting edge technologies. So um, all of this financing and funding and incentive will come to play for all of those things. Once again, we thank you for joining us today and we look forward to seeing you in a future session. Bye-bye.